Anybody do traveling over Christmas? I mean, it's, it's kind of the holiday time can often be the highway time as we go from one place to the next place. Few of us have multiple families to visit on the same day, and that always keeps things interesting, doesn't it? And I don't know what it is about dads. My dad was like this, and uh, some of y'all in here are like this as well. But let me see if I can do this. There we go. If you got a long distance to travel, you best go to the bathroom now. We ain't stopping till we get there, and that's just the way that that's going to be. You know, messing up the timetable is not good. That's not, that will not happen on this trip. And, of course, with the excitement of Christmas, traveling with young ones who just can't wait to get everywhere so they can go a little nuts or a lot nuts makes the trip eventful for sure. It's like full moon at Walmart, you know. You never know what you're going to see or what's going to happen. Sitting quietly and writing isn't really the deal on Christmas Day. And if you're talking teenagers, well, teens are embarrassed by what their parents say, think, eat, wear, and sing. So for their sakes, don't smile at wait staff. Don't, don't, uh, don't sing with the windows up or down. And by the way, if you could stop breathing and just leave me be, that would be just fine. Christmas has always been a time of travel, right? There were some folks who did some traveling on the first Christmas. They, uh, they came from the east. Now, we're not positive what that is, where exactly that is. We have some hints, though, in Scripture. Scripture is good about this. You, it, you know, study and, and dig deep. See, the east for the Hebrew people could be lots of places, but Isaiah called Persia, which is the Iran-Iraq area, the east in, 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 in the, his writings, in Genesis, the city of Haran was said to be in the east, and we know where that was. In Numbers, the king of Moab brought Balaam. Y'all, anybody familiar with Balaam? What's, what's, what's his big thing? Donkey talking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he was a non-Israelite prophet. He wasn't Israelite. Um, but he's from a place between Aleppo and Carchemish in the east. So we kind of have an idea of where this... Uh, the Magi came from. It's very likely the Iraq-Iran area. Here's the thing about that. They didn't have cars and trucks and buses and all those kind of things. So they had to travel via camel. And what were they following? So when did they travel? At night. So it took them probably about 40 days from when they started to get to where they were going, to get to Herod. And uh, Matthew chapter 2, we're going to be in Matthew um, chapter 2 for the, for the main core of the story. Uh, it says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law, and he asked them, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? And they answered him, in Bethlehem in Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd of his people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. When you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him as well. After that interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshiped. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. You know, the, those gifts, gold, why would you give a baby gold? And yet, where did they go not long after this? Yeah, they had to go to Egypt, and that gold would come in handy. Myrrh, which is a burial. Spice. 
He was born already knowing his path. Uh, this is from back, back to Bethlehem is from uh, Max Lucado, and he makes a, an observation that I want to, I think, is really good. He says that the Herod, that Herod and the Magi share the same chapter, but not the same heart. Right. The same chapter, but not the same heart. We're going to spend some time on that this morning. The Magi acted in humility. They were humble about what they saw and they heard. They didn't come in you know, arrogantly or, we're the Magi from the east. We three kings of Orient are. Only there was a lot more than three of them in all likelihood. And they ended up being directed to Jesus. They found the truth in this psalm. Read that for me. Declare the glory of the Lord. Skies proclaim the work of his hands. See, God is visible. You know, I'm still waiting for the audible voice, but man, I see him in a lot of places. I hear him in, through a lot of voices, a lot of folks. Herod, on the other hand, he acted in pride. He was threatened by a baby. Threatened by a baby. And so he immediately sought to destroy Jesus. You know, this is such a, a powerful story, and, and it's easy to get drawn into the Hallmark version, right? The, the Hallmark version of it, where we have the sentimental Christmas card that portray the birth of Jesus in subtle tones of endless peace and gentle animals, adoring angels. Yet underneath all that, Herod's anger aimed at Jesus. He killed all the kids in Bethlehem who were two years old and younger. All. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, stay there until, he, until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. Jesus had to go to Egypt to fulfill prophecy. The, the things that, what did Jesus come to do? He came to fulfill the law. And he did. From the time of his birth, he was fulfilling the prophetic word that came from the prophets of old. I called my son out of Egypt. You know, and that doesn't make sense. Well, he was born in Bethlehem. Yes, but he had to flee. And when I called him back, I called him from that, the nation of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. Another prophecy fulfilled. A cry was heard in Ramah. Weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. I mentioned briefly last week, one of the things about this Christmas story, and it didn't click for me until not that long ago, probably about eight, ten years ago. It's the first place where the chosen and the unchosen are brought together. I love that about the birth of Christ and the massive change that that is, that the chosen people who were separate for, and, 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 and were God's people and separate. If you asked any of them, uh, any of them, are you the, who's the chosen? They'd say, we're the chosen people. Everybody else is the unchosen people. And yet, in the birth of Christ, the shepherds were who? Chosen, they were the Jewish people, and, and the angels appeared to them, and the magi. They were the unchosen. They were Gentiles. And in the birth of the Savior of the world, it begins. It begins. All people, one people. All of us together. A message of unity and love, of hope. You want to, that's the message of hope and peace. The unchosen and chosen coming together. But even in the midst of that amazement and that amazing birth, tragedy, Occurs is brought by human pride. Man, our pride gets in the way a lot. Herod had a desire for control and power. 
it's interesting as well that when we look at the, at the manger, who we got over there? We got, uh-oh, the baby's gone. <laughs> is, is there any doubt who, who, who did it? Where? That was funny. <laughs> Why are you turning bright red? Oh, okay. So Jesus is not on the roof this year. Jesus is, that's nice. But we have Mary and Joseph, and we have shepherds and magi. You know who's not there? This is weird, right? Who did Herod go to? He went to his wise folks. You know, he said, okay, so tell me about the prophecy and what it's supposed to be. And so they tell him, and not one of them went. Isn't that weird? Wouldn't you think that at least that one of them might have traveled to go to Bethlehem and at least see, but none of them, none of the Hebrew wise men took the time to go with them. No interest. See, following Christ will always require more than believing, but actually acting on that faith. Orthodoxy is what we believe. Orthopraxy is what we practice. And those things go together. Even demons believe. They just don't follow. What was that you said, Brad? Because I I love that. Obedience. There is no faith without obedience and no obedience without faith. That's what we're talking about here. You can say you believe something. But it requires more than just head knowledge. Requires hands and feet knowledge, right? Salvation is by grace through faith alone, but followers of Jesus can't help when that, when that hits our heart. We can't help but act. It's Paul and James together. You know, a lot of folks try to put those things at odds with each other, but they're not. They're like this. You know, faith, we're saved by faith. through. What is that again? You tell me. Paul says we are saved by grace through faith, faith, faith through grace, not of works, lest anyone boast. So that's Paul. We're saved by grace through faith. James, faith without is dead. Well, wait a minute. Paul just told us we don't have to do nothing. James just told us we have to do something. How does that work? Salvation is not of us. That's of Christ. But man, once you get that salvation in your heart, your life will change. You cannot encounter the living God and not emerge from that change and different in behavior. You know, we don't do it for it to be saved. We do it because we can't help it. You know, we follow Christ and the things of, of his so that, so that people can see him in us so that we might possibly have a conversation. You know, conversation about God, a conversation about Jesus. Just to, that they would that they what is different about you? You know, they're gonna, we're different than everyone else. We're known by how we love one another. We've got to love each other well so that people go, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's different. I want to be like that. I want some of that. So this morning we're going to look at the benefits of genuine humility, and that's exhibited by the Magi and the consequences of rage displayed by Herod. The Magi teach us that God will use all possible means to get us to Jesus. They weren't chosen. They were unchosen. They were of another nation, and yet they pointed the way to Jesus. And God used several means to bring the Magi. One, he used nature. That that the you know the 
the, the heavens cry out of the glory of God. The star was a sign from God. It was, it was, it, God used that the star in, in creation. He also used scripture. That's why we push scripture so hard around here. You know, the scriptures in Matthew, Herod's scholars pointed to, to were from actually the prophet Micah. It's Micah 5.2. It says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. Whose origins are where? Of old. Yeah. What's John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word, oh, that's pretty old. The ruler will come. From ancient, from the beginning. The Magi followed the sign of that star. They obeyed the Hebrew scriptures. They obeyed the Hebrew scriptures better than the Hebrews obeyed their own. They found Jesus. They worshiped him as king. They demonstrated the humility of not, it's, it wasn't their way. They were following another way. But God did more because he then used a dream to guide them away from Herod. Max talks about, and, and I, we used to learn this in school. I don't think they teach much about Helen Keller in school anymore, do they? Just a little bit. Well, Matt, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> our, our interpreter says, yes, it's all I got. We, we use her a lot. It, the story's amazing, though, right, Teresa? I mean, it, Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan, they're in the, depicted in the movie The Miracle Worker. Helen, who was deaf, blind, and mute, she wasn't born that way. It was because of a childhood disease. She, she couldn't hear, she couldn't see, and she couldn't speak. Dang. That'd, that'd make it rough. And she resisted Ann Sullivan, who was there to teach her, attempts to teach her to function in a world of sight and sound. But Ann didn't give up. And she finally found a way. She persisted until they got a breakthrough. She pressed in her hand. They can't see, hear, or speak. And, and this, so she pressed in her hand the sign for water. And it began to open up for Helen her world. Here's the thing. God, like Anne, will persist. He will not give up on you to lead us from our blindness into the light of Christ's presence. He will use all means necessary to guide us home to Jesus. Those opportunities are going to be there. Herod teaches us that, that not all will follow that direction, though. Not everybody's going to follow, and, and some folks are going to reject Herod and his biblical scholars. They didn't follow the star. They didn't obey the scripture. And then out of pride, Herod was threatened by that question. Where is the one who was born to be king of the Jews? And so he lied to the Magi. Find the child and I will come and worship him too. And later, kill all the boys in Bethlehem, age two and under. Dean Ferrari is a Christian scholar from the 19th century. And he had this sad commentary on Herod, Herod's life. Ferrar puts it this way, he says, his whole career was red with the blood of murder, death by strangulation, death by burning, death by being cleft asunder, death by secret assassination, confessions forced by unutterable torture, acts of insolent and inhumane lust. The survivors during his lifetime were even more miserable than the sufferers. That was Herod. That's the kingdom. That, that's the time that Jesus was born into. God hates pride vehemently. Proverbs 16, 5. The Lord detests the proud, and they will surely be punished. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 5. And now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in his glory when he's revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you're going to get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. When the great shepherd appears, you'll receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. 
In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in his honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Sing it for me. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Higher and higher, and he will lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. Higher and higher, and he will lift you up. I think you got it now. You ready? Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. Higher and higher, and he will lift you up. Humility leads to being lifted up by God. That's kind of cool. God opposes the proud. The Greek word rendered oppose is antitasso. It means to oppose and resist, but it also has a kind of a battle meaning to it too. It means to range and battle against. And we all need to do serious soul examination because we can get hooked on our own importance and refuse to respond in the ways that God uses us, wants to use us to guide us to Jesus and to guide others. If we're prideful, God will oppose that. Antipasso, he will range in battle against us and our pride, yet if we are humble, he will lift us up. Where do you find God? Where, where, where are those places? Because we're different, right? And we see God in different ways. In the creation. What, what parts of the creation? Some of y'all are outdoorsy. What gets you? Where do you see God? Mountains. Sunrise, sunrise, sunsets, yeah. No ocean people? <laughs> God is in creation if, if we will look. How about a baby's birth? The miracle of that. A doctor's report. And Lord, by the way, we've been praying for the mothers that this year ends the, tr the trouble and trials and next year begins the... Celebration and joy. Just reminding you. How has God used scripture to nudge you closer? What's some of your life scripture? Some of y'all have a scripture you go to. First Peter 5, 7. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Galatians 2, 20 is? I'm, absolutely, yeah, I'm crucified with Christ. Yeah. Joshua 1 9. Be not afraid. My help comes from the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen, right? I love the Psalms of Ascent. Uh, you know, the, uh, when, you, when you get to the Psalms, they, they, they'll call them Psalms of Ascent. They, they, would, they, they would use those to climb the hill to Jerusalem. So those are the Psalms that they would sing as they were going up to the city because it was uphill. <laughs> and it, they were literally Psalms of Ascent. Absolutely. You know, it comes in a lot of different ways. It could be a, 
You know, it could be a passage of scripture on Facebook, on, you know, I, I bash social media so much, so let me say there are some good things that, that happen with it. Um, you know, you could just from a radio, radio or TV, you could be walking by some and, and hear that thing that God wants you to hear. Uh, one of the things that I encourage you and challenge you to do is when God puts a person in your head, send them a message. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to call them. If you want to call them, call them. But send them a text and say, hey, you just popped in my head. I wanted to let you know I'm thinking about you. And see what happens. Watch what happens when we listen to that still, quiet voice in our head. Because you'll impact lives in a way that you, you just, you'll be shocked. I've had some really interesting, long, in-depth conversation based on, hey, you popped in my head. So I challenge you to do that. We get to choose, right? We get to choose which direction we want to go. The way of God and Jesus is clearly humility. Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And Proverbs sixteen eighteen goes to Herod. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. I kind of like the message version. It says, first pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. One way leads to ruin. The other way leads to Jesus. You choose. You choose. One way or the other. Isn't that crazy? God gives us that. Now, I'm biased. Choose Jesus, okay? (laughs) 